and a good day to you all around the world. And those listening on the recording, welcome in. Today, we are going to be talking about top webby innovations across all of the BI 4.2 service packs. Thanks for coming to uh, join the conversation today. I am so happy to have back into the 360 studio, uh, Pascal Galan and Gregory Botticcio. Thank you both uh, for coming and uh, attending and, and giving us your insights onto the innovations that have happened in Levy over the past 4.2 service packs. And before we get going, I just wanna give some housekeeping. Uh, submit your questions anytime. There's a questions block in the GoToWebinar control panel on the right-hand side. <clears throat> if you've pushed it over, just hit the orange button, the little arrow, it'll pop back open. Um, please put your questions in. We're going to make time to answer those at the end. And then, of course, if it's a, a quick, easy question, we might answer in line um, during the presentation as well. But uh, I do want to give you a, a forewarning that this uh, recording may end up, the presentation may end up going longer than the 60 minutes we have set. Uh, not to worry, we are recording. The recording has already started, and you will definitely receive that if you've signed up or if you are here today. So no worries if you have to drop, but please hang out as long as you can, because we'll get to the meat of your questions and everything towards the end. Um, there is also a uh, an exit survey. We like to make sure that we're continually improving here at 360 and want to make sure that we're doing a good job by you guys. So please help us if, if there's anything we can do, or even if you want to say out of boy, Nathan, you did a good job today. I always appreciate that. Uh, so we've got a little wrap up here of what is going to be addressed today. Now these aren't going to go service pack by service pack. However, we wanted to organize it for you uh, in the presentation so that you can see all the different aspects of what we're going to demo, what uh, Gregory and Pascal are going to be talking about today. Um, they're going to go by topic. Uh, so, you know, you can put this back together as we get through each of the areas, but uh, we have got some jam packed full of good information to help take it to the business and to really inform the presentation today to help uh, Pascal and uh, Gregory to customize, if you will, the information that they're bringing. I want to take a quick second to pull the audience. What versions are you on? So have you made it to 4.2 yet? Are you thinking about it? Is it on the list? Um, if you're there, which version of 4.2 are you in? SB1, 2 to 3? or five, six, seven. Uh, earlier today, we did a French version of this webinar. We were really impressed with how many people were in 4.2. Um, so I'll be interested to see how we end up here today. And please make sure if you're uh, listening, uh, jump on over. You can see on your screen, we've got the poll up. Make sure that you get in and vote. It helps just give everybody a, a good sense of the audience that we have. And, uh, the audience that is here attending today. And of course, the more people that participate, the better the numbers are. So I'm gonna give this just another 10 seconds. Come in, get your vote heard if you are on the fringes. And I'm gonna wrap this one up. So a whopping 59, almost 60% are in SP6 or SP7. It's pretty good. 26% in 4.2, SP4 and 5, 11% SP1, 2, and 3, and still a small 4% back in 4.1. I'm sure you are probably working on moving up as we speak. And I'll go ahead and hide those results. Gregory, uh, Pascal, any comments, thoughts on that? All right, so now that we've gotten all of the information on the table, I do want to bring in Pascal first. Pascal, I'm going to make you presenter here. And why don't you take us into the presentation, sir? Okay. Good morning, everyone. 
I'm just going to close that one here. Okay. Perfect. I can see your screen. Okay, good. So we're going to start with the uh, new visualization we have introduced in uh, 4.2. Um, so let me open my document and show you right away where they are. Um, first of all, the geomaps uh, which were introduced in uh, SP2 uh, right at the beginning of the 4.2, the first public release of uh, 4.2 SP2. We introduced three kinds of uh, geomaps, uh, the, uh, what's called the core place, where the uh, regions you have selected are colored according to the value of the, uh, the, the measure which is applied to the, uh, to the map. Another one which is the uh, GeoPi. Um, again, the uh, uh, the, uh, the measure is applied to the uh, to color the different value uh, the sector of the uh, the pi and the pi are applied uh, um, displayed on top on in the center of the regions uh, which are selected for the the map, and then the uh, more traditional uh, geo bubble uh, geo map where the size of the bubble depends on the uh, on the measure. Um, so the uh, the geo map all the uh, geo data is uh, embedded into a web intelligence. It's uh, the, we have a geographical database here embedded in the uh, in the uh, chart engine. And the way it works, I'm going to switch to design to uh, show you how it works. Uh, where you go to your dictionary of uh, that, uh, the data you have uh, fetched from uh, with your queries. And uh, typically here I have city and you go and you edit as a geography, the object uh, you have selected and you have two ways to edit as a geography, either by name or by latitude longitude. In the case of the city, I already did the job and uh, that's by name. So I have this, uh, dialog box here which is showing me the all the values for a series the values I, I got from uh, my query and each time the uh, I select here the level of uh, my geography so in that case city we offer four different levels going from country down to city with region and subregion in between typically in the year US region would be the state and subregion will be the counties um, and, and then the uh, UI will automatically match with uh, whatever is found in the uh, in the database. In case there are some uh, multiple uh, matches, possible matches, then the uh, the it will show you here. You have the score uh, of the match, uh, and uh, for some values, let me see. Typically, Mexico, uh, Mexico here. I know this is Mexico City from Mexico, the country Mexico, but Typically in our database, we have several other cities called Mexico and several of them are actually in the US. So I need, as a user, and they all match at 100%, so as a user, I need to match uh, myself uh, which one I want to, uh, to see, okay? So this is the way it works for the uh, geo machine. Uh, in case I want to use the uh, latitude longitude, so typically here for continent, so which has been done by latitude longitude, I'm going to pick uh, some uh, in my dictionary some uh, two values latitude and longitude I have um, uh, and those values uh, latitude and longitude values are the the, uh, the data I got from uh, from my query so I'm going to pick those and uh, it will automatically um, assign uh, the uh, the location of the values according to this uh, latitude longitude or assign the location on the map here. Um, the zooming on the map is uh, is done automatically according to the values which are displayed, but you can modify that manually if you wish. You can also, uh, as you can see here, uh, change the uh, the color of the the sea, the uh, the ground, and the. Uh, um, uh, here we have a measure which is a uh, gradual uh, in the in blue, but you can change the uh, the color map like any other uh, chart in WebB basically. What you can also do is uh, you can do this uh, geographical mapping on uh, merge object. So typically here on continent, I had on my, if I switch to uh, query mode, I can show you that. I had one query with the uh, continent, um, the, uh, the values for the continent, but since it's not available in my, uh, in my geo uh, database, I added um, 
another query based on an Excel spreadsheet for which I have the latitude longitude of the center of each of those continents. And then I merge the two into continent here, and this is the object I have uh, geo-qualified. Now, using the latitude longitude from uh, the uh, taken from the Excel spreadsheet, so it's fairly flexible. Um, you can do whatever you can show whatever you want on the on the map. It doesn't have to be cities, region, or whatever. I mean, it could be uh, I don't know um, plants if you have uh, plants or factories or whatever you want. It doesn't matter as long as you have the longitude longitude. It will show up on the map. The other thing, the other thing to notice here is the uh, the little sign here, uh, warning sign on this geomap. That means that not all values are, uh, have been geo qualified, and I did did that on purpose to uh, show you uh, what it is. Typically here for Korea, um, it says it didn't find didn't find the uh, the value because it's got two values for Korea, either South Korea or North Korea. So I have to choose myself, and if I don't, then it shows as unmatched value here, and there's a one inside on the geomap. So this is for the uh, quick introduction to the uh, geomap, uh, so which were available right at the beginning of the uh, folder two. Um, later on, in folder two SP4, we introduced the gauges, uh, either as a speed speedometer or more traditional linear or circular gauge. Um, uh, so um, these um, uh, these uh, charts uh, they use um, so measures and you can also have um, maximum value and a minimum value. They are both optional. If you don't set those, then they, they will the chart will automatically pick the uh, maximum it can uh, can find uh, in your data. Um, you can uh, configure uh, the the colors which are displayed here, uh, the rank. Uh, basically, the uh, the different here. There are three uh, three um, th th uh, uh, going from red uh, to orange uh, to green. You can change the color. You can uh, you can change the value, the uh, threshold between those uh, different uh, ranges. Um, you can configure the the KPI, which is the current value here. Uh, uh, here in the in the middle or right there. You see there. Are, I mean, there are many ways to configure that. Um, for the gauges, the linear or circular gauge, uh, the target here, which is displayed, uh, it's optional. Uh, you, and you can configure the way it looks, the, its color, whether you you display the value or not. Uh, you can even uh, configure the, the angle of the uh, circular gauge. So it's pretty flexible here again, um, the way it looks, and uh, you can make it uh, really nice if you wish. And for the 2SP4, we also introduced some tiles uh, to display uh, an important uh, KPIs into your document uh, with, uh, again, very configura configurable sorry, uh, charts. Uh, here, one with a rounded corner, another one with uh, straight corners, square corner corners, uh, different colors you can pick here for the, the title, the subtitle, the background of the KPI itself, and the uh, the footer. You can have, a, you can uh, put some um, comments or whatever you want into the subtitle, just like the title, you can change it, or the footer. Here I have just, you know, uh, put a unit. And we have two different uh, type of tiles. Um, uh, one which is uh, straightforward and the other one which use uh, deviation. And deviation is uh, based, uh, this is a little arrow here, and that means you, you need to provide uh, another value uh, here to, to make uh, to make it work is the previous uh, value basically and depending on the, um, the the variation between the previous value and the current value the row will be up or down. Uh, the color is based on the uh, percentage of the uh, um, to the uh, of the value according to the uh, to the target you can optionally uh, specify. So here different type of tiles. Uh, then in folder 2SP6, we introduced the uh, funnel and the perm pyramid. They're, they're very similar, huh? they, except that they, they, 
it's the opposite direction. I mean, uh, but uh, it's it's really the same uh, the same type of chart. Uh, here you have uh, one which is in uh, 3D. That's an option. Uh, you can make it flat. Uh, you can also sort uh, the uh, the the order of the uh, the value which are displayed. Here I've, I've selected to display uh, at the top uh, the uh, the more most important uh, value the, the biggest value but i could uh, could display the opposite and start with the uh, smallest value and same thing for the pyramid i can uh, change the uh, display order uh, you can configure what we want to see as uh, data values here the label and the value here i just have the label and percentage compared to the uh, for, for, to the total uh, the, to the uh, legend is uh, is optional um, well, you can, you can config the, configure them uh, as you wish. So that's it for the uh, visualizations we introduced in Folder 2. So from Folder 2 SP2 to Folder 2 SP6. Next, I'm going to show you the uh, new analysis uh, capabilities we introduced in, uh, in uh, is it here, right? Uh, in Folder 2. Uh, first of all, the group of input controls. So, uh, first of all, I should show you the input controls. So, this is the way it looks. Um, and I'm going to switch to design to show you the uh, the way it's, uh, it's uh, configured. So, basically, you have a new uh, dialog box here uh, to create a group. Uh, when you have uh, created several input controls, then uh, you can give a, a uh, name to that group and select the input controls you want to um, include into that uh, that group. And uh, what it does is that the uh, the group of input control then uh, will uh, influence the, whenever you select a value in uh, in, in uh, one of the input control in that group, it will influence the, the values which are uh, in the other input control. So typically here, since I selected Asia, I, I, as a country, I only see uh, the Asian countries. If I uh, switch to uh, Europe, then I will only see the uh, the country European countries here. And if I select all values, then I get all countries. Okay, so that's the the, the basic principle of uh, input uh, of group of input control. That's uh, that's the difference between uh, uh, individual input controls. Okay, uh, what else you can do with it? Uh, I mean. You can do that in reading too. You can uh, typically, if I select, uh, I can remove an input control from the uh, filter path, meaning it won't influence the uh, the content of the other uh, input control anymore. So typically, if I remove uh, the continent from the filter path, then it switches to all values, and then it. Uh, I can select uh, here just the uh, the value I, I want from the uh, the country without influencing the uh, the continent. Okay. Um, another uh, so that was introduced in Folder 2 SP3. Um, another feature analysis feature we introduced very important feature we introduced in uh, in Folder 2 SP3 as well and to switch to design to show you the detail exactly. So they, they're called uh, reference cells and they show here in a specific folder into your uh, object dictionary called references. And they are uh, basically a cell. It's it's like in Excel, Microsoft Excel, basically. You pick a cell uh, in a table, uh, wherever it is in your document, and you, and you make it as a reference. So typically that's what I've done with this cell here. The, late orders um, in uh, 2007 and the late orders of uh, 2008 eight for South America. So one of them, I, 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 that's the way it is. You right click on the, on the cell, you assign a reference and it will create uh, this reference here. So that's the, what I called here the last year late references. And here the uh, late orders for this year are just called late orders. And what can you do with reference cells? Well, you can you can feed uh, a chart, a okay, um, tile typically, a KPI, if you want just to show the late orders for South America, which is what I did here. 
then I can show you the current uh, percentage of late order here without uh, rebuilding all the context, the calculation to get that particular figure. I just pick it up here in the table and I can show the deviation from previous year uh, because I selected the, um, the, uh, the figure from last year as a, as a reference as well in last year. Uh, so if you look at the assignment, the data assignment here, of the uh, of this uh, tile, then you can see it uses the uh, reference sales. I've uh, the references I have created here, so you can use these uh, references in any variable. Uh, they're like variable. You can use them in, uh, in to build formulas. Uh, if you happen to um, to update your document and the values uh, would change here in the table, then the, the, uh, the reference cell value would change as well. I mean, it's completely linked. Um, so that's it for the reference cells uh, available since folder to SP3. In folder to SP and SP5, we uh, we did some catch up with uh, Desky uh, on the on the break uh, on the breaks. Uh, for for those you who know uh, Desky, uh, there used to be uh, two features in uh, the breaks which were not available in Webby until uh, folder to SP5, and that first one was the ability to choose on which value of a dimension to uh, to uh, display that break. Uh, typically here, I have a list of countries. For some countries, I have several cities. From some other countries, I only have one city. So no need to, to display a break for those uh, specific countries. So what I do here, I go to the, the country, uh, manage break, and then here I select value based break, and then I select the values the of that dimension for which I want to display a break. That is the the, uh, the countries for which I have uh, several cities. Okay, so that's the way it works. This wasn't possible to do uh, before, uh, in, uh, before folder to SP5. The other break uh, feature we've introduced in folder to SP5, and again, this is a cast up from, uh, from this key, is the ability to show uh, the break on the same level for, for two uh, different or more, actually, two or more uh, dimensions. And again, this was something which was not possible to do before, and that allows you to build the tables which lo look like this, where you have for each uh, break on the uh, on the country uh, dimension, you also have the break on the continent, so uh, both uh, both cells are aligned every time. And so, uh, let me show you how it works. Um, manage break. This is how it works. I mean, you can see the break is at the same level, and it it uses both continent and country. And uh, to, to make it work, I just edited the the break. That's a new button. We button we introduced in folder to SP5, and that's where I can select all the uh, dimension in my table I want to use on that same level of break. One thing to remember, this is not compatible with the uh, value-based breaks I just uh, showed you before. Um, this restriction was already uh, in place in, uh, in this key, so we haven't changed anything here. Last feature, there is not much to see here, it's the delete trading blanks, and it applies in the, uh, in the query panel. When you open up your query panel on, uh, so on your query, you go to the properties, you have a small box here, option to delete the trailing blanks, and that will uh, delete all the uh, the blank character, the space character, basically at the end of each value on your query, uh, which means that sometimes uh, when you have a table and you see two values which they look similar and they show at two separate rows, and often this is because there's a space uh, or residual one or more space at the end of uh, one of the two values, and uh, if you click on that, then it will automatically delete these space characters at the end of the values, and they will show up as a, a same uh, same row. I don't have any um, a document with such uh, a configuration, so I couldn't show you how it works. But this is how it is available. So this is for the um, uh, so for, for delete uh, training blanks in folder two SP five. I do have more to show you uh, here. Uh, another feature, uh, and I need to open another document for that. Uh, that's the ability to show uh, the, uh, the 
or to change the order of the hierarchies. And traditionally, in Webby, it's always pounds first. So when you have a hierarchy like this with world, then Europe as a child, then uh, all the children of Europe here, they show first world, then, the, then Europe, and then the, the children next. Um, starting from folder 2 SP5, you can change uh, this, uh, this order and have the children uh, displayed first. So again, for world and Europe, I will have first, I will start with the children of uh, Europe and then, uh, and then I have a world uh, at the bottom. Okay, so it doesn't change the sorting order of the values itself. Look at the uh, here it's still the same sort in order. We have uh, 8, then 18, 19, 23. It's increasing order. It's still increasing order in the uh, in the other table. It's just that the order of the parents and the uh, and the children are, are reversed. And the way to, to do that, you've got to switch to design, okay? And you go to the uh, sort, advanced sort, and here you have used this new parameter children first or parent first, which is the, the default. So if I switch to parent first, then I come back to the, the default and then the children first. Here we are. I have the uh, children first in my hierarchy. This is very convenient for uh, all the people in your organization who are building some uh, financial tables and they need the total at the bottom rather than at the top. Okay, that's the main reason why we did that. Um, what's next? Uh, the intra document links. Uh, intra document links uh, were introduced in uh, Folder 2 SP6. Uh, there are uh, hyperlinks uh, within your web documents and they allow you to switch from one report to another uh, without clicking on the uh, on the tabs here and just by clicking on those hyperlinks. So it's a very convenient way to, to build um, at the beginning of your document, for instance, um, table of content of your document and each, uh, each content, each line is an hyperlink to the uh, report, uh, another report to your document. So typically here, if I click on that, I go to the second report, then marketing, I go to the uh, next one, etc. I can come back there. So I, we made it nice here to show you which to show you the user which one is actually um, currently uh, selected. But uh, I mean, it's it's fairly simple to to use. Um, how that app works? Uh, let me switch to design again. Okay, and go here. Go to linking, uh, and we have a edit link here. And this is the new tab here in this um, dialog box, intra document link. And here I have this list of all the reports available into my document. I just pick the one I want to uh, switch on. Easy to use and nice to uh, nice for the end users, especially with the new uh, web intelligence client, the interactive client, where you don't have those uh, tabs here. So it makes it really nice to uh, to navigate your document. Um, so now I'll switch to my other machine here, and I want to show you a bit of um, customization which uh, was uh, added uh, in uh, Folder 2, customization of your Webby document. Okay, so the first one is the uh, custom elements I introduced uh, at the very beginning of uh, Folder 2. C custom elements are a third-party visualization that you, you built yourself, uh, you uh, implemented uh, on your own, or you, you acquired from uh, partners. Uh, there are a number of partners uh, out there we, who build those uh, customizations. So typically here we build the uh, or one of them and just using the uh, Google, Google Chart API and with a bit of a JavaScript, then uh, we uh, created this uh, visualization. And what we provide uh, as the uh, Webby team is a public API to consume uh, those external visualization within a Webby document. They're really like uh, any Webby chart. I mean, if I switch to design, 
Okay, so this is a this is a block. I can can copy, paste. I can delete. I can turn into a table. I can filter the content. I can sort the content. I can even rank it. I can hide it, etc. Align with other documents. And if I uh, I can assign, of course, that's the most important thing I should be able to do. So using the objects in my dictionary, I can pick. Um, as long as they with they're compatible with the uh, element I have selected, then I can uh, I can select a, any of them. And uh, and when I, whenever I refresh the document, obviously the the visualization uh, this uh, custom element will be um, uh, refreshed as well. Uh, custom elements they appear here in the specific tab here. There when you do insert custom element. There you have the choice between different custom element library. If you configure several of them, and I can pick the the one I want to uh, to uh, to um, to insert in my in my document. So it's really completely integrated into Webby, as a, like it would be a, a Webby chart, except that it's not a Webby chart. It's a external uh, external visualization from uh, from a third party. Um, Something important to understand: you need to configure the the service which is going to provide those uh, visualization, and this is something you do uh, in um, okay in in the CMC. So if I go to the CMC, then I go to the applications. Um, so web intelligence application. I have here uh, a tab for the custom elements and the different services I have configured. So typically here, the Google chart, uh, where uh, I go to the server we, where we, we, we made this uh, piece of uh, JavaScript uh, running uh, and, and a port, okay. Uh, you can also use an extension point. If you have extension point, there's a possibility to use an extension, extension point as a, as a custom element uh, service. A custom element service can provide uh, several uh, custom element visualization, as you saw the, uh, in the document when I tried to insert one. Uh, once you, you connect it to the, uh, your custom element service, you can test its uh, uh, it, it, it's working fine. Uh, you have uh, the choice of uh, selecting between different media time. If the type, if the uh, if the custom elements service provide a different type of media, then you can pick the the one uh, the one you want, and uh, and that's it. And then you can also enable or disable the custom element service you don't want. Typically, we have two uh, old custom element service here we don't use anymore. So this is one aspect of the customization we provided in uh, in Webby for the two. So that was in for the two SP2. Another thing we we did that was at the very end, uh, very recently in for the two SP7 is the ability to customize the uh, right click uh, the contextual menu. So that's this menu here. When I select an object in my in my rep in the report area and I right click, then I got all the comments here, the actions I can apply to this uh, the element I selected. So again, this is something you control in the CMC, uh, and that's like any other customization of the uh, UI. Uh, when you go to uh, to the users and you pick uh, uh, one of the user group, uh, so here administrator, for instance, and I go to customization here, and here I have the list of everything I can customize for this particular group of uh, user. I can uh, decide to remove the splash screen or the status bar, the side panel or whatever. I mean, this was available uh, before for the two, so nothing new here. What's new is the report area contextual uh, menu. And if I unfold that, you can see you have here all the actions which are traditionally available on that contextual menu. I can decide which one I want to uh, keep for that group of user or, or the ones I want to remove. So for instance, if I don't want my user in that group to make any comment on the um, on the uh, on the blocks uh, in my report, and I can unselect that one and it will, won't show anymore into the uh, into the document for those uh, users. So this is the way it works, the customization of this uh, contextual menu, right-click contextual menu, uh, available since folder to SP7. Um, we improved also the uh, security of uh, the uh, of uh, Webby. Uh, first of all, um, 
HTML whitelist, which is now uh, available uh, in um, since 4.2 SP5. Uh, this is again something you control uh, in the CMC. You have here, right in the middle, easy to find, authorized HTML elements. Those are all the elements, so they, they are the default ones. Huh? You, you can change that list, obviously. You can decide to, to remove any of, uh, of, uh, of these uh, elements, or you can uh, change, the, change its definition. You, you have the ability to not only um, select which tag, HTML tag you want to allow uh, in, your, in Webby, but also which attributes for this tag. Uh, are allowed. So you, you just specify here the list of attributes which are allowed uh, for in HTML. Okay, so, and that applies to the custom elements and so to the extension, extension points. So anything which is external uh, to WB, uh, there's a bit of a uh, control here. So, to, so those uh, extensions, third-party extensions, won't do anything stupid uh, in, your, uh, in your document. Uh, another uh, security issue we uh, fixed in uh, for the 2 SP5. It's uh, a well-known uh, uh, security hole uh, when uh, when you publish a web document as a CSV document as a CSV. Um, if you happen to have any of those specific characters in your web uh, table, the table which Got, uh, which got exported like uh, the uh, at plus minus or uh, equal, then it will automatically trigger an action uh, when you open the uh, CSV uh, uh, document into Microsoft Excel. So to prevent that from, from happening, uh, we, just, uh, we just had um, um, a space character before this uh, specific uh, character here. So typically here I have this table uh, as an example. I just put that uh, Excel uh, function which normally displays the uh, current date and time. Okay, and I exported this document uh, here uh, as a CSV. Uh, here's the result. Uh, maybe I could increase the size for you to see it better. So this is the result and you can see that now it's not executed. Why it's not executed? Because there's a space character before equals. If I remove that space character, okay, just, and you see it gets automatically executed, but at least it doesn't get automatically executed with this um, with this uh, correction security fix here. Uh, if you don't want this uh, security fix, then it can be disabled in the registry. Uh, this is uh, explained into the uh, WebE documentation on how to do this. Next, uh, next functionality we've introduced in uh, folder two. So coming back to the documents, I should have it here, uh, right here. Uh, those are the the prone variants. So prone variants are for a BW uh, data source. And BW, you often have uh, lots and lots of uh, variables which are um, translated into prompts into the uh, WebE query panel. And when you uh, want to switch from, uh, when you refresh your uh, document, you have all these prompts to answer that uh, can be uh, really cumbersome. And sometimes, uh, and there's a feature, with a nice feature which exists on the BW side, which is what's called a variant, sort of profile of all the prompts you usually uh, or rather the answer to those prompts, the answers you usually uh, pick and you select on those prompts. And you can have uh, like this, uh, the different profiles uh, with a different uh, prompt value basically. So how does that work? Simply if I refresh my document here, okay, and I got here a, a list of uh, prompts. Uh, I can see there here, uh, that's for Argentina. 2004, and the uh, this variable was set to uh, to hybrid. Uh, coming, coming, is it coming? Here we are. So here, this is the I have here this uh, variant. Uh, so it's available in uh, reading. It doesn't. We don't need to be in uh, design mode for that. So it's available for anyone, any any user. 
um, and uh, I can choose another uh, profile, uh, so another variant. So typically, if I want, I have defined here my Canada profile, so Canada profile. This is for country Canada, and that's for another uh, product. Um, um, family here mountain and uh, still the the same uh, the same year i define a third profile here for portugal so obviously country portugal and yet another uh, another uh, product family so the way you define a um, um, a profile a variant here just click here Okay, select the value you want there. Okay, and then once you're done with your uh, selection, you just click here to save that into the profile, or you can create uh, an additional uh, variant if you wish. You can create as many of you wish, or you can uh, delete uh, the old ones you don't use anymore, etc. So I was in the I was using here the Argentina profile. So if I switch to Portugal, okay, it automatically applies the answers I selected for that profile, for that variant, okay, and then I just change and here we are. I get the result for that for that variant. I can switch to another variant, Canada, for instance, and just switch. So it's really easy, really quick to use. You don't have to reselect again all your, your prompts. You just pick the one you have uh, saved here, uh, the variant you have selected, and then you switch uh, quickly onto the, uh, the, uh, the profile and the, the variant, the prompt you have uh, selected. So this is for the, uh, that's it for the uh, prompt variants introduced in 4.2 SP4 and uh, uh, very useful for all those uh, all our customers who are using a BW uh, data source. Um, I think I'm done. Uh, I did uh, everything I wanted to show. I think I'm going to uh, switch to uh, the, the screen to Gregory because uh, yeah, I yeah, I demonstrated all the features I wanted to show you uh, here. So let's switch to uh, Gregory now. Okay, thanks for Pascal. Come on in, Gregory. Okay, uh, let me see what I can share now. I don't get the opportunity to share my screen, or at least I don't have the option. Change presenter, Gregory Boutique or me. Okay, and now yeah, I, let me know when you can see something. Coming yeah. through. It's good. It's good? Okay, yes. thanks Rose Pascal. So let's move on. So the next one I'm going to share with you is something that, which is not really new, but you you might already know it. That's commentaries inside the webby document. I'm going to explain you how it works. So let's open first this document. So that's a webby document at due time. So since uh, the photo 2 size pack 2, we have introduced a commentary solution, which is uh, for you the ability to comment your document and not to comment outside your document. You can comment in the context of the data uh, you are looking at. So it works in different ways. The first and easy one is to place inside the report canvas uh, a commentary cell like this one, a first comment here. Uh, once you have uh, placed this kind of post-it inside your report, you can select it, access the comment to, commentary thread here, and you can uh, uh, do a reply. Uh, let's see if it works. So let's see, first comment. Uh, okay, first, second comment. Second comment. Here we go. Let's see if it works. Okay, yes, it works nicely. Uh, I can enter my, I can do reply to my own comments when the document is shared. Everybody who have access to this document plus everybody who have the commentary authorizations can uh, reply on my comment and share it inside. Uh, you can have more than one commentary cell inside a, a report or webby document. Uh, you can place a post-it, that's the first way to use it. The second way is something that you might already use, which is add a comment at the table cell level. So in this case, we keep the context. So if I want to comment Houston for the year 2014, I just have to select the cell corresponding to this and enter uh, a comment. Great, 
with you validate here we go and once this is done uh, of course the comment won't dis won't be displayed automatically you just have to do an overlay with your mouse and you will see uh, in the pop-up what is uh, the last comment entered in the context of house houston and the year 2014. so it works for a table cell but it works also for a chart so in this case in the case of a chart or any other chart you're going to comment the block uh, comment for a chart okay so in this case again here we go so the block is commented uh, i mentioned that you can place a comment in a table cell by keeping the context meaning that austin 2014 is the context for this comment uh, great result uh, if the line has to change so for example if 2014 disappear of course the comment will not be deleted it will simply disappear from the it will be hidden, in fact. Uh, there is another way to use the context is to place, for example, a commentary cell into a section. For example, here I have a section on the year 2014 Q1. I have placed a comment here, another comment cell in context of this section. And guess what? Uh, this comment is valid only for the section selected, so for 2014 Q1. If I scroll down to the next section, for example, Q2, of course the comment will disappear because that's a different context so it works really nicely you can keep the context of your different uh, comments comments uh, if the context change the comment is simply hidden if the context come back to the original state of the comment the comment will appear again uh, just to let you know that the comments are not stored inside the web document you have a specific database for that and you have authorization to allow end user to use it. So here I've added some comments that are visible for myself and for other person. Uh, um, let's uh, quickly show you how you enable the commentary solution inside the report. Uh, like I said, uh, this is a commentary cell. So to place a commentary cell, you just have to go into report element, commentary cell, predefined comment here. For example, here I'm going to place arbitrary another commentary cell here, for example. As you can see, it's quite easy to place another one. Um, uh, the first comment versus the last comment. Here I have comment to refresh, and I've choose to display the last comment, but it could stay uh, to the first comment. So you just have to go in properties, document, and you choose which comment has to be displayed in the commentary cell. So last comment here of the first comment. Let's select back first comment. So in this case, for all the commentary cell, inside the thread is going to choose the first comment entered rather than the last comment. Uh, I'm going to log in with another user for the same web document. I'm going to show you uh, how the report will look like if I use a user with no commentary authorization. So for this, I'm going to log off and log in again with this user, com1 which has no commentary authorization. I'm going to reopen the same web document. And here we go. So in this case, this user has no commentary authorizations. It, we have denied the right to see any comments entered in a web document. And moreover, we have denied the right to comment the web document even if there is uh, a commentary cell available in the report canvas. It can do nothing. So to achieve this, it's quite easy. Uh, you just have to go into the CMC. Uh, you select your folders, specific folders, a specific document. In my case, I'm going to select the commentaries document, this one. Right click, user security. Oh, where is this user security here? I select a user of group or user. So in this case, I use come one to assign security. And if I go to advanced, that's the list here of authorization and right that you can deny to the user or group of user on a folder or a specific document that will enable or disable the commentary solution. So there is some rights such as view commands that the user has created, view commands from the BI commentary, uh, view comments on the document or not, view comments or document owed or not, hide comments that the user has created or not, uh, modify your comments, delete your comments, um, and so on and so on. So you have a full 
uh, control of this commentary solution. I think this is mandatory. We might not want some confidential comment to be shared with everybody or to be seen by everybody. So you can control that. Um, maybe instead, because I'm using CMC, I'm going to show you how you choose the database for the commentary. Like I said, the database. Uh, there is a database that will receive all the commentaries, so you just have to go in applications. Inside applications, you choose um, BI commentary application. Double click here. By default, it will be the audit database, but you can choose any other database of your choice, the ones that are being supported by Business Objects Platform, for instance. Okay, so that's all for the commentary. Let's move on for the next. Uh, Demo, so I'm going to log off and choose the admin one again. Okay, administrator. And my next demo recounts a refresh improvement we have introduced in SAP Business OBX Web Intelligence. So uh, let's open a specific document again. That's report number eight, refresh improvements. So starting further to SP2, we have introduced a parallel refresh of the queries. So for example, here in this document, I have uh, six queries, one report here per query. So I have six queries. I'm not going to hit the refresh button. You have to trust me, but to refresh the six queries inside this web document, it takes altogether 36 seconds. The reason why is quite simple. The refresh, the parallel refresh is not activated, so the different queries are executed one by one, one after one. So, so it takes in total 36 seconds. So now let's activate the option parallel refresh and let's see how uh, the refresh improvement look like. So to activate the parallel refresh, uh, you have to look in two places in the CMC. Let's, uh, let's come back into the CMC. So the first place you have to look at is inside the list of servers and services. Open Web Intelligence Services and look at the Web Intelligence Processing Server. If you open the properties, there is one entry, which is for these specific services, how many parallel queries can be executed per document by the web processing server. By default, this is 64, and by default, this is the maximum. Maximum, and by default, you can execute 64 parallel queries in parallel for one web document. It's not uh, a recommendation. You will have to fine tune this. This is not where the place you can tune it, but by default, you can execute 64 maximum. Then if you want to fine tune how many queries you want to execute for a web document, you have to go in another, in another place, uh, which is, oh, I close it. I have to reopen it, which is, uh, um, Ah, sorry, I have to go somewhere else, which is here, connect. Should have done that before. Connect. I have to enter this one. Okay, uh, it's not here, that's... Uh, I'll have to do something. Uh, one second, please. Uh, We like to. Okay, I just want, don't want to show you uh, the password of my system, so I have just to hide the screen for one second. Copy, just to log in into the system and paste my password. Here we go. Okay, and now you can all see back my screen. I hope. Here we go. So to the second place, what you have to look at is the connection of your universe. So in my web document for the seven query, for six queries, I'm using a universe, something that uh, you are very familiar with, which is the e-fashion universe. Oh, close. Just a mistake in the password. And this universe is using this connection, which is e-fashion connection here, e-fashion webby. 
And here in the properties of this uh, connection, there is one entry to evade the parallel roof rays. So one equals, this is not activated. Let's set this to four and save. Here we go. Now that this is done, let's come back to uh, inside the web document, which is here. Here we go. And now let's hit the refresh button and let's see how many times it will take to uh, refresh the six queries now with four being selected as maximum in parallel. So I would expect the time to be divided at least by two. Let's see how many times it will take now. Okay, 18, yes, great. So when you set four, it has executed the very four queries in parallel and next the two last one in parallel and we have divided by, by two uh, uh, the time required to refresh the six queries of this web document. That's the first thing. The second thing I would like to show you is how you can also gain additional refresh time uh, for, for your web document. I have six queries, but do I really need the six queries to be executed every time I hit the refresh button? I don't think so, because some queries are more stable than the other. For example, if I have a query which just bring back in my web document the list of product, my list of product don't change, it doesn't change uh, every day or every morning. So you can imagine that once this query is refreshed one, you can save the data inside the web document and exclude this query to be refreshed the next time. So this capability is called exclude data provider refresh. So to enable it, you just have to go in data access, edit, and for the six queries that you have here, you just have to access the pop of the query and uncheck refreshable. And that's it. You validate. Let's do this for half of the queries of the web document. So remove the option refreshable. Here we go. I remove for the three of them. Properties, refreshable. Okay. And now let's just uh, close, but before apply the change is done. And here we go. So now the very first three queries will not be refreshed anymore. And the only three queries can be refreshed. Uh, you can uh, confirm that by looking at the list of refresh queries available. So I have six queries, but only three of them remain available for refresh. The first three ones are just gray out, which means that it won't be refreshed. So now let's hit the refresh button to refresh everything. I, I mean the, the last three queries. And let's see how many performance gain I will get in this situation. So I would expect the time divided by two again. And here we go. Not not really two, I would expect nine, but 10 seconds. So that's already a good improvement. So for, from 36 to 10 seconds by leveraging this kind of improvement. Parallel refresh plus exclude the queries from the pool of refresh uh, query. So that's it. Uh, another thing I would like to show you, which is still related to uh, refresh, uh, it's not really um, uh, uh, a performance gain, but that's something that has been asked by some of you uh, recently, that's the ability to open, but inside the new Webit Engine's interactive viewer, a specific uh, Webit document. Uh, let's take, uh, let's open this one. And to make this Webit document open on very big and to make it refresh automatically. So you call this automatic refresh mode. If you enable it, you can refresh to be set to every, let's say two minutes, for instance. If you click validate, what is going to happen? If you have prompts, you're going to be prompted and you have to fill in the prompts only once. So your the value selected will be kept. And uh, the session will remain open as long as this option automatic refresh is activated. And that's it. And if you do nothing between two refresh, the document uh, remain available for your consumption. You can go to the next page, play with the filters and so on and so on. And after two minutes, the re document will be refreshed again to display new data. If you want to display an update, 
uh, of the data that could have happened between uh, the last refresh, which, which was two minutes ago. Uh, there is a timestamp at the top to remind you that this document has been refreshed as a, uh, when it has been refreshed the last time. And the option turn off automatic refresh here. If I click here, uh, I stop the automatic refresh and I get full control of my Ruby document. And I can, of course, uh, close the session by doing a simple logout. So automatic refresh. Uh, something I would like to share, I forget to mention, but the uh, parallel refresh, it works for all type of data providers, right? Uh, I mean, uh, UNV, UNX, uh, Anaviews, uh, Free and SQL, uh, Excel files, Stack files, and the exclude queries from the refresh works also for the same data providers, UNV, UNX, Sapana Direct Access, BEX queries, uh, free and SQL, text and Excel files as well. Okay, let's do, uh, I have to do log off logon because I just closed the section the other side. It's not going to work if I click somewhere. So let's log in again. Now let's open another document, which is Data merge. So this one has been introduced starting for the two size pack form. So what I would like to show you is not only you can merge a dimension coming from two uh, 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 queries, but you can also merge hierarchical objects. For for example, to achieve this, you have to be in design mode. So here I have two query, query one, query two. From query one, I have hierarchy with the nodes Europe and North America, uh, as you can see. In the second query, I have Asia Pack and Middle East. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to merge these two hierarchies uh, together in order to get only one hierarchical objects. So to achieve this, it's easy. You have to sort your objects by query. You select query one, country hierarchy one, query two, country hierarchy two, right click, merge, and that's it. So I have one hierarchical objects that will summarize the two uh, objects, so just have to drag and drop here, and here we go. Uh, this query, uh, let me do a formatting, increase the size, here we go, and now I can drag and drop some information here. What I miss the border, here we go. And from the query two, let's add order quantity as well. Here we go. So now I have one hierarchy for Europe, North America, and Asia, Pac, and Middle East, with, uh, which are synchronized and displayed as one object. That's the first thing. Uh, the next thing I would like to show you is that not only can you merge a hierarchical dimension with a hierarchical dimension, but you can do, you can merge uh, and merge, yes, you can merge a hierarchy with a flat dimension, such as this one, query for hierarchy object, which is a flat dimension. So there's no hierarchy here. So, uh, and to try to achieve this is quite easy. You just have to select again the hierarchy country one from query one and select the flat objects from the query number four. Right click, merge, and here we go. So here's both object has been synchronized now. And if I drag and drop it here, here we go. So the objects, that are available. Okay, let me increase. The objects that are available in my flat list will be synchronized with the one available in my hierarchy. That's the case for all the countries from Europe and all the countries for North America here. And the objects which are not available in my hierarchy or in the one of the nodes of my hierarchy, so meaning Pan North America, would just been added individually at the bottom of the hierarchy. That's what we have here. And now, because objects are synchronized, uh, I can use uh, uh, the same measures uh, to display the correct information. Here we go. The objects have been synchronized. So it works nicely again. Okay, let's move on. So let's close this one. Uh, my next demonstration uh, is uh, I should have demo it right after the refresh, refresh parallel refresh improvement, because this one is quite impressive. We call this the view time security. So, and this one can really improve also 
uh, the refresh time of your web document. So imagine that now, instead of doing refresh on open or scheduling your web document for 1,000 users that require uh, 1,000 version of uh, the same report but with different slice of data, you just just need now to refresh to create one web document that will contain all information. You refresh it. Uh, live or you, you schedule it to be refreshed and you share it with 1,000 users. And this is only at the view time, meaning that when the user will select the report with all the data, that the document will show to this to a user only the piece of data is allowed to see at the view time without performing any refresh. We call this the view time security. And it's really powerful and easy to use Again, to achieve this, uh, uh, for example, I show you the master data, the master document with all the data. And to enable it, you just have to go into IDT again. So let's go in IDT and the universe used in, my, in this web document. Open the security editor here. And for the security editor, Select the users that you would like to apply uh, to you, for which user you would like to uh, apply some securities. We call these the view time, some business security profiles. So you select at the same time the universe. So if I show here, so you have to select the user or group of users and the universe. And here I have two business security profiles already defined of two types. The first one, object lines, means that. Uh, this user, when he will consume the universe if fashion, this user is allowed to see all the objects, but not the objects lines, which means that if he create a web document on the if fashion universe, he will have access to everything, but not to the objects line. And if this user open a web document that is using the objects line, the objects and, and its info information should be completely obfuscated. So that's what this business rule mean. The second one, State California only works as a filter. It means that in the case of this user, when he consumes this universe, this user can only see data corresponding to state equal California. So it's super easy to enable it. You just have to edit the filter select one of the objects uh, from the universe, so for example, state, and do state equal to California. That's it. So now you have two business security profiles which are available for the universe efficient.unix, but not applied to the user uh, VTS1. So if you want to enable it, it's really simple for this user. You just have to do a check like this. Uh, you do a check mark and you validate by clicking on, and that's it. So now let's come back to this web document so I can see all information being the administrator. Let's log off and log in being the user VTS2. And let's see how this document look like with this, with these two BSP apply on my profile. So VTS2. Log on. Let's open the same web document. So here we go. So because I was really strict with the business security profile, the lines, which one, one of the header of the quest table here, the data and the information are obfuscated. That's the reason why we have the H, the H syntax. And the second one, a state equal California, has been applied so I can see information related to California uh, for the table and of course it was for the chart. The chart was all about uh, margin by lines of items because lines is not an object I can view and consume. Uh, that's the reason why the chart looks like this. Okay, so business security profile apply at the view time and not at the refresh time. Or oh, something quite important also uh, to mention. Uh, let's log off and let's open the original web document being the administrator. So I mentioned how to activate it by uh, leveraging the uh, business security profile. But there is something uh, also in addition that you have to do. 
at the original inside the original web document and this is monetary there is one option that needs to be uh, activated if you want to make it work for your end user sorry here we go uh, that's the view time see yes inside the properties of the original web document so you have to go into at the design time in the properties document you have to choose apply security filtering on open and not at the refresh time right it's monetary apply security filtering on open which means that in, when the document is open you're going to check if this user uh, on top of this universe has some business security profile created if yes he will apply them at the view time here we go so now uh, let's open the last document it will be my last explanation it's not a demo but rather more just to let you know that uh, if you want if you don't want to use anymore the web java applet you can and you have better started by leveraging the dhtml starting the bi 42 sp3 because starting bi 42 sp3 we have added the vast majority of the capabilities that were missing from the Java Webby Java applet inside the Webby DHTML. So this concerns the support of Excel data sources, uh, the query panel for Bex query, Unix on SAP Bex data providers, complex filtering in the query panel, conditional formatting, you can not only consume them but edit and create new ones, format number, you can create and, and edit new format number, you can leverage the change source it works from the dhtml and the export as capabilities as the same option than the webby java applet export capabilities as well uh, what is still missing there is still some missing capabilities data manager document as a web service so the ability to select a web document and make it uh, as a web service uh, the ability to create a query on top of a web service so that's a data provider type the grid for the canvas or the snap to grid for the canvas at the design time the right to left interface doesn't work today in the dhtml uh, what we support is a right to left document not interface and the search across report or rule document today you can search across the report being displayed so all these missing features will be added not in further two but in the further three later on despite this uh, we have even added more capabilities in the html than what you find in the webby uh, java applet for example not only do we support the excel data source as uh, as a as an option but you have added the ability to consume text files and csv file uh, from the dhtml webby client as well okay uh, it was my last, uh, well, I should not say slide, but last uh, demo. So thanks a lot. So now maybe I have, uh, yes, uh, answer the questions. If you have questions, so don't hesitate to ask your questions via the, the question panel here. Yes, and that brings us actually up to our second uh, poll question as well, just before we get to questions want to make sure that we give everyone an opportunity. So would you be interested to join the BI 4.3 standard beta program? Starts December 17th. Um, just co click yes or no. Um, I don't know why you click no. That's a really cool opportunity to be able to get access to the new version uh, coming. But uh, got an opportunity here. Yeah, something quite important. So you have the uh, scoping call the uh, yeah the next week, but you still have time to 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 to, to join us. Don't hesitate to let us know if you want uh, via via GBN Smith if you want to join to join this uh, BI for the three standard beta program. That's all. Great to um, that was a really nice look. We got a bunch of questions as well. So um, really good engagement. And I was thinking about this. This was actually, this topic came from from the people of GB and Smith's, uh, or, you know, the 360 Suite webinars. So, 
68 percent of the people here would like to join. So, um, okay, so if you want to pass along, or we going to send that an email? Thank you. Just quickly, before we get to questions, you know, one of the reasons why 360 is such a huge fan of uh, Gregory Pascal, the whole BI team there at uh, at SAP, is because we built a whole solution set that plugs into those business objects to help you get from one version to the next, it, to help you manage, scale, and move across as versions of your OS and your database and all the different aspects of things that can change and move along the way as time and technology continue to grow. And so I wanted to take just a second, if you're thinking about 4.3 or even you're still coming up to 4.2 uh, lesson seven, um, we can do a ton to help ease the path from one end to the next. As you can see in this uh, visualization, we can help you prepare, evaluate, promote, back up, clean up, uh, ensure that you've got a good solid backup and clean up in your new environment, optimize things, make sure that uh, you're you're keeping a nice tight clean environment, ensure quality so that uh, you know with a uh, hundred percent capture of any regressions in your reporting to make sure that your uh, reputation in the BI uh, center with your users maintains and grows adoption. Uh, it's one of the, I think, the biggest keys to rolling out new versions is to continue to give people better capabilities. But if the data is wrong or the reporting is coming back and it's not what they're expecting, then you're going to have issues with people just wanting to go to so Make sure that you keep that in line, uh, ensure that you can analyze any sort of impact. And uh, go live and comply. If you if you live in a world of compliance with business objects, we can absolutely help you make sure that you answer all the questions around the who's what, who's what, why, all of that kind of good stuff. There's a whole white paper around this on our website. Um, please check it out. Um, so how can we buy? So there's, uh, there's the business object side, of course, and there's the 360 side. So if we can do anything to support you guys. Last poll, and then we're going into questions. Just, uh, is there anything we can do to help you upgrade your environment? I know there are areas around preparation, backup, cleanup, promotion, optimization. Um, just looking for a quick demo. On what Does any of this make sense? Um, you'd be joining 600 plus customers around the world in the 360 um, community and growing. It's a, it's a good place to be. As you can see, we engage the community, we engage our uh, customers, we engage with SAP to make sure that we're bringing you and giving you access to the best and uh, most up-to-date information possible. So I'm going to leave this up for just another minute uh, to get everybody who wanted to respond. of looking through uh, the questions here. Were there any of these that you wanted to pull out and uh, discuss for everyone here? Uh, we can't hear you. Uh -oh. You can't hear me. Okay, no, your your voice seems very far away. But that's okay. Apologies. Um, I was I was bringing up the questions. I I know that you guys did a good job of sort of answering along the way, um, but I wanted to see if there were any of these questions that you wanted to bring up okay. and discuss. Yep. Okay. Okay, let's me, maybe I will take so, some of the questions that concern my the part I've presented. So, can, for example, uh, can business security profile be driven dynamically from a table? Um, 
know the business security profile are defined at the universe level. They are quite static, unfortunately. Uh, if I'm correct, yes. So no. Uh, then uh, okay. If users don't have rights to see comments, can the comment box be hidden so they don't see it at all versus seeing a blank box? Ah, that's interesting. Um, so it means that you like to hidden automatically as a commentary cell from the report canvas if the users don't have the right, uh, don't, doesn't, doesn't have any uh, commentary authorization. I don't think this is doable. I don't think. Except if, no, I don't, no, like, like this on top of my, my, my head, no, I don't think this is possible, unfortunately. Uh, hello, what else? In fact, yeah. Uh, can comments be included on scheduled document when saved as web? Yes, uh, you can do that. Uh, the commentary uh, added in the commentary cell, which are visible on the report canvas, can of course, I forgot to mention it, be exported, exported cell or exported as part of the PDF file, PDF file. That's not the case if the comment is entered into a table cell or if the comment is entered for a block, such as a chart. So in this case, you have to consider other solutions. Uh, what are these other solutions? Uh, if you want to export to PDF comment, all the comments attached to a table, the best way to do that is to create a universe, a specific universe on top of the commentary database. And because you have a universe in this case, you can query the commentary database to get the comment for a specific report that will be, for example, displayed as a table in the document. And in this case, because that's a table, it can be exported as part of the PDF. So the, the, the solution I've just described here concerns the commentary part of uh, the table cell, right? If they are attached to uh, a specific com commentary cell, they are visible and fully exported as part of the PDF. And what else? Are there additional questions for uh, the way I have? Uh, can you put BI commentary in a report instance? Uh, yes, you have the option. Uh, every time you create an instance, for example, at the schedule time, I think you have the option, if I remember correctly, to keep the comment from the previous instance or uh, uh, hide the comments, uh, because you might want to start with a fresh version of the same web document in order to let the user comment another version of the web document. So yes, that's possible. Uh, what else? Uh, Yes, I think that's all related to the question I had. Uh, yep, that's all. The questions from your section. Pascal? Yep, sorry. Question for me? Uh, yes, do you want to comment some of the questions related to the BI variants entered into the question chat, for, for instance? Um, regarding the BI variants, I'm not sure um, about the, the answer, so I ask my question to my colleague back here in Paris, waiting for the answers. I can forward those, those answers to, uh, to Nathan uh, after, after the, uh, the webinar. Um, just had one question regarding the value-based break. Is it possible to avoid breaks for single values and doesn't display footer values? Uh, there are independent settings in the uh, manage break uh, dialog box. So you can uh, use the uh, value-based break and then uh, decide for the selected values whether or not you want to uh, display the, uh, the uh, break footer. I think that's, uh, that's it, really. Uh... It's been a pleasure to have you both. I really do appreciate you guys taking some time to engage with the community, engage with 360 Suite. Pleasure to have you this uh, morning's webcast. And uh, really look forward to the next time we get together in 2020. This is the last webinar of the 360 Suite series this year. Can you believe we are almost finished? 
with 2019. Uh, so, that uh, any of the that Cal uh, mentioned, we will pass along in commentary, either email or phone call, um, as a follow up to those who ask the questions. And uh, if you need anything at all, please, there's a um, contact at ACCC.io uh, on the page here. If you can be of any assistance, please don't hesitate to reach out. And uh, with that, I bid you all a good afternoon and um, a good rest of your 2019. And we'll talk to you again in 2020. Cheers. Thank you, everyone, for okay, your thanks attention. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.